Okay, so the unit one should be up now. I don't have any of those prerequisites where you have to do things in order or anything for this module. I think by now y'all kind of got the hang of how um, the modules work. So everything is in there, it is in the order in which you know you would look at it, but it's there. So the first one is the one that I just um, modified. So it has all of the um, learning objectives for this particular section. And then of course, the same order applies to like our to-do list. First thing is to go to lectures, then go through the corresponding homeworks. Eventually we'll get to the review, the Q&A session in class, and then the test, right? That's the same, it's gonna be the same pattern for all of them. So today we're only gonna concentrate on working on P.6, which is the rectangular coordinate system. Again, some of you may have seen it before, some of you may not have, so I have to go from the beginning, okay? Um, we gotta make sure everybody's at the same um, level. Then the next thing is that the following Tuesday on the 14th is when we're going to do, uh, I put the homework and I need to go into web design and make these changes and I will. Let me write it down so I don't forget. Um, so unit one is gonna now be due at 11.59 PM. So I'm kind of taking us off of that schedule that we were doing before. I feel like it might've been rushing it a little bit too bit with that unit B because we covered that 1.5 and then immediately the next class, y'all were supposed to do the 1.5 and the review. Then we did our Q and A and then you just jump straight into the test, okay? I feel like if I space it out a little bit more, it'll give you some more time to retain the information. So instead of trying to do the Q and A and the test on the same day, we're gonna separate them into two separate days, okay? Um, that way that gives you an extra day to start working on that review. You can ask all your questions about the review in class. And we have plenty of time to cover it. We don't have to try to rush it in like 30, 40 minutes. Does that make sense? Okay. And then we can take the whole class period if we need to the next class to do the test. Okay. Um, if I feel like that's wasting a lot of time, like if we get there and things are moving faster than I'm expecting them to move, then I'll modify it again. Okay. But I want to make sure that I try to give you guys room because I want you to retain the information. With math, unfortunately, um, it's not like a lot of other subjects where you learn something and then that chapter's over and then you learn something completely different and then that chapter's over, you know, and it goes like that, you know, history classes work a lot like that. Um, although history in itself can build upon itself. Um, but there are some, some subjects where you can get away with that. With math though, unfortunately, whatever we did in unit A, you're going to keep seeing throughout the whole rest of the semester. Whatever we did in unit B, you're going to see throughout the rest of the semester. So if you were struggling really, really hard in unit A and unit B, you do have chances to like redeem yourself as far as like eventually learn the material and eventually be able to perform at that level. Um, but you're not gonna be able to just not do it. Does that make sense? Okay, you'll have to go back. Even if you can't get credit for those homework assignments, go back to them and look at them and try them and you'll see the answers. So you'll know whether or not you got them right or not. Um, but try those unit A and unit B homeworks to make sure that you've got that content under your belt, okay? You wanna make sure that you have that strong foundation moving forward, okay? Um, I do have a test. And before I will, let me hand them out first and then I'm gonna put some numbers on the board. So let me pause this because we're not gonna do any lesson just yet. Am I recording? So just like before, we have that basic timeline. If you click here, you can get the uh, unit workbook, right? But you guys, as a face-to-face -face class, um, you already got the actual physical workbook. Um, for the online students, they can click on that and they can print it if they choose to, or they can just use the PDF file to follow along. Um, I actually got my own workbook, so that's what I'm gonna use on the camera instead of having to use the slides, okay? So if we have this here, this is, I'm not sure what page it is. I don't even know that they're marked pages, like page one, page two, because it doesn't look like they are. But if you are gonna follow with me in your workbook, you need to find where it starts with unit one, okay? So I won't be going, having to go back and forth between my slides and then my paper like I was doing in the past, now that we have the printed version, okay? So in this section, they're just covering all the objectives, like 
what is the contents of this? So the first thing we're gonna learn about is the Cartesian plane. And then we might have an example, then we're gonna learn the distance formula, then we'll have another example. And then the midpoint formula, two examples, and then finally we'll get to those practice problems, okay? When we get to the practice problems, those are the ones where I'm gonna to try to get you guys to steer me in the right direction. Because we should have seen examples of all the practice problems before we get there, okay? And so hopefully as we're doing the examples, I will be the leading force in those examples and explaining and all of that. But then when we get to the practice, I'll start asking some leading questions. Like, well, what should I do first? And does anybody have any ideas on what I need to do? You know, things like that, okay? So that I can get you guys more engaged, okay? So let's go ahead and look at the first page. So this is talking about the Cartesian plane. And it was invented by a guy named Rene Descartes. And I remember this guy, because when I was in high school, I had to paint the picture of this guy. So that's the only reason why I remember Descartes. Um, but he is the one that created the Cartesian plane. And this was way back with like 15, 1500s. That's how long ago he was alive. Probably like early 1600s is when all of this was created. So. It seems like a long time, but really it has not been that long. It's only been like four or 500 years, right? It has not been that long um, that all this math stuff was created. Um, so basically what we have is we have two real number lines where one is horizontal and then the other one is vertical. And they are number lines because they're centered at zero and then they go to the negative direction infinitely. And then they go to the positive direction infinitely, right? Now, even though this one is vertical, it's still doing the same thing. It's centered at zero, it goes up to positive infinity, and then it goes down to negative infinity. So it is also a number line. It's just instead of being horizontal, they flipped it up and made it vertical, right? So it is a vertical um, number line. But because you have two intersecting lines here, what that does is it creates four regions, right? And so they want to name those regions. And especially when you get to pre-calculus, you want to know which region you're in, okay? Because depending on what region you're in, that's gonna tell you basically the sign of the um, coordinates inside that particular region, okay? So for instance, you have quadrant one. And the way it works is the top right is always gonna be quadrant one, and then it goes counterclockwise. So not like the clock the other way, okay? So the clock goes this way, you're gonna go the other direction. And in pre-cal, all of your angles and everything else, when you get there, they all go counterclockwise. So have to get used to that motion, counterclockwise, okay? So it's quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and then quadrant four. Now, if you notice, if I'm in quadrant one, what are the signs of my, um, my x-axis and my y-axis if I'm inside this quadrant? Both of them are positive, right? Now we haven't gotten there just yet, but we will eventually talk about an ordered pair. And I will get to this where X is in front and Y is in the back, always. That's why they called it an ordered pair because now you know that always the X is gonna be in the front and the Ys are gonna be in the back, always, okay? For in quadrant two, what are gonna be the signs? What are the signs for the X axis? Negative, and then what are the signs for the y axis up there? Positive. And then in quadrant three, what are the signs for the x axis? And then what are the signs for the y axis? And then now, lastly, quadrant four, what are the signs for the x? And then the signs for the y? Negative. So notice they have completely different signs, right? Even though these two both have positives and negatives, where those positives and negatives are, are, are different, right? So here it's saying your X's are positive and your Y's, I'm sorry, <laughs> here it's saying your X's are negative and your Y's are positive, and here it's the reverse. The X's are positive and the Y's are negative. Right? So the order in which you put these things in, these little parentheses, it matters, okay? That's why they're called ordered pairs. Always, always called ordered pairs. So it's just doing the same thing I kind of did. They already had it labeled there. I verbally labeled it, 
but it's telling you that the horizontal real number line is called the x-axis and then the vertical one is called the y-axis. That little center point where the two intersect, I don't know if you can see it right there in the center, they darkened it just to make it apparent, okay? But that spot right there normally doesn't have a darkened circle, but that spot there is called the origin, okay? And anytime we're gonna plot a point, Okay. In order for you to plot a point, they're going to give you the, the coordinates, the x comma y inside parentheses. You always have to start here before you start trying to figure out where you're going to go to plot that point. That's why they call it origin, because that's where you start. Okay. Um, and then, of course, it creates those four regions, which are now called quadrants. And then every point in the plane corresponds to an ordered pair. This will give you the location of that point, okay? So this will basically tell you the um, left or right location. Another way of saying that is horizontal. And then the Y coordinate actually tells you up or down, which is also called the vertical location. Okay. So X tells you how many to move left or right. The Y tells you how many to move up or down. And then the sign is really what tells you whether you're going left or right. So for X, if it's negative, you'll be moving to the left. If it's a positive number, you'll be moving to the right. That makes sense because if I'm looking at this number line up here, aren't the negatives to the left on the X axis? And then the positives are to the right on the X axis, right? Similarly, for the Y values, in order for me to go up, it'll have to be a positive number. And then in order for me to go down, it needs to be a negative. Same reason, on my Y axis, the positives are up here and the negatives are down below, okay? So those signs will tell you where these locations are. And that information coincides with those signs that we labeled on all the quadrants, right? We said that if you were in this quadrant, you should be a positive, so you'd be to the right, and you'd be up positive, right? And that matches this. Here, I would have to have gone left, which would be a negative, and then up, which would be a positive, which corresponds to that. You see what I'm saying? Similarly for these, I'm going left and down, so both negative. Here, I'm going right, so it's a positive, but I'm going down, which means the y value is a negative, okay? Okay, again, Sorry, <laughs> it's like torture if you already know all this information, but if you don't, this is, you need to know it, right? Okay, so now we get into the Cartesian plane. So they're gonna tell us that this number, whatever number it is in there, is called the X coordinate, this guy right here. And then this number, whatever that happens to be, is the Y coordinate, okay? So this tells you, I don't like the way they phrase this. It says directed distance from the Y axis but that basically means left or right. I just don't like these words because it sounds confusing. Um, directed distance from the X axis, that basically means it's going up or down. Because if you're moving away from the X axis, you're either gonna be going up or you're gonna be going down. Okay. And so it says that that notation, putting the X comma Y inside the parentheses, that is going to be what denotes a point. So remember what I told you guys on the test, you always have that notation box, right? It's always like some number of points per problem. Um, this is important because a lot of people will just say like two, three, but that just looks like two answers to me, right? Isn't that how you type in your answers when you solve equations in the box on web assign? You say that's two answers, right? That is not the same as telling me the answer is one point, which is in the location of two, three, okay? So you have to make sure that if you're talking about just regular solutions, no parentheses. If you're talking about a point, it has to be in those parentheses, okay? That's the notation part there. Okay, more information. We just have lots of information <laughs> that will get the actual math stuff. Uh, where we're computing something or doing something. So another piece of information is it says that the beauty of the rectangular coordinate system is that it allows you to see these relationships between two variables. 
So it, eventually you learn to graph, right? And so then you have visual representation. You're telling me these things have a linear relationship. To me, that means it should look like a line. And when you graph it, it does look like a line. Okay. You're telling me it has a quadratic um, relationship. I know from experience that quadratics look like parabolas. So when I graph a quadratic, it should look like a parabola, basically like a U going like this or upside down like a hill. Okay. Um, eventually, when we get further into the college algebra stuff, you will be able to know what the basic shapes of the graphs are going to look like. So as soon as you see like a cube, you already kind of know it looks like a chair. As soon as you see an X to the fourth, you know it looks like a big bowl. You know, you start getting those um, concepts in your mind. You will have that section. So you have to know those, okay? Okay, and then you also need to know like, why do not all X to the fourth graph look exactly the same, right? Because there's different pieces in that polynomial and they affect the graph in different ways. And that's essentially what this whole class is gonna teach you is how, when I manipulate those polynomials, how is that going to change my graph, okay? If that's the big goal for like all of chapter, I think it's three, chapter three in the college algebra stuff, okay? So we'll have big stuff in there, big ideas. Um, it would be, what does it say? It would be difficult to overestimate the importance of Descartes' introduction. Oh, they're just saying like, it's a big deal. <laughs> this stuff is like super huge. It allowed us to make a whole bunch of different advancements. For me, particularly, I am a visual learner, so it definitely helps me to graph things. When and if you ever get to calculus two, I can't tell you how many times knowing how to graph saved me in calculus two problems because they have these problems where they're like, oh, you're taking this graph and you're revolving it around the x-axis and now it's creating a solid of revolution, right? Because you revolved it. And now you're supposed to imagine it's a solid. Now find the volume of that solid, right? But if my brain doesn't know like how far, you know, how far up is it going? How far out is it going for me to get those radiuses and those measurements? Then I can't do it. And so being able to graph it really, really helps me. And I only have to graph in 2D. I don't have to graph in 3D to do that problem, okay? So it really will come in handy. It's not something that I recommend you just try to like, get over the hurdle <laughs> and then dismiss it. The graphing is a huge thing in this class, okay? Okay, so for example one, it's the basic. It just wants us to plot these points. So they give us a whole bunch of points and then they're asking us to go through it. Now remember, a negative in the X position means I'm going to go left and I'm going to go left one unit, right? And then in the Y coordinate here, it's either up or down. Because it's positive, it should be going up and it would go up two units, okay? Similarly, if I go all the way over here, this would mean negative means it would be going left two units. A negative here means it would be going down three units. The first spot tells me left or right. The second spot tells me up or down, right? What does it mean when it has a zero though? This tells me it's gonna go to the right three but what does it mean when there's a zero here? Mm -hmm. That means there's no up or down at all, right? It just stays, okay? And the same with the zero, zero. You start at the origin, but you're not gonna move left or right, and you're not gonna move up or down, so then you're still at that spot, aren't you? Zero, zero, okay? For here, you would go left one and then up two, for this one, you would go positive, so to the right three, and then positive, so you would go up four. That one we just talked about. Here we would go positive right three, but then do not move up or down. So we're stuck right there, and that's why there's a dot there. And then here, go left two, and then down three, and now we're in this point, okay? Give me some coordinates using numbers one through four, what would the coordinates have to be in order for me to have a point down here? Two, negative two, let's see. So two and then negative two, yes, that is right. Right, because you want to go to the right and then you want to go down. So positive and then negative, good. Okay, here's the new one, this is a big one. The distance formula. 
So the distance formula actually does come from the Pythagorean theorem. Intrigue, you're gonna see the Pythagorean theorem a whole bunch. So might as well get used to it now, right? But the Pythagorean theorem basically says that if you have a right triangle like this, the side across from the right angle, and the right angle is usually indicated with a little box on the corner, okay? But the side completely across from that is called the hypotenuse. And then the other two sides don't have special names. They, I don't know why they call them legs, but they do. Um, so the other two are just legs. It doesn't matter whether you call it A or you call it B, they're both the legs, okay? And they both could be different measurements or they could be the same measure, you know, okay? Um, when it comes to labeling a triangle, if you have the, you can identify the hypotenuse right away. But then when it comes to labeling one of the eggs, a, legs A or B, you can label them whichever way you want. Notice that after you're going to have to add them together and it doesn't matter what order you add things in, you get the same answer, right? So it really doesn't matter about who you label A and who you label B, okay? C is the one that's important though. You must use C for the hypotenuse. You don't have a choice on that one, okay? Okay, so let's see, how do they use that formula to create the distance formula? So what they do is the first thing they do is they label, they have a point here and they have a point here and they wanna know the distance between those two points, okay? What they do is they label the coordinates of this point because you don't wanna be specific. I don't want to prove information for you when it only applies to like two, three and four, four, right? I don't wanna do that. I wanna make this as general as possible so that it applies to everything, no matter where you are on the coordinate system, okay? So they leave it very general. They just call it X1 and Y1, okay? Who knows what the X coordinate's gonna be? Who knows what the Y coordinate's gonna be? And then this one down here, they call it X2 and Y2. Okay. So that's the X coordinate of the first point, the Y coordinate of the first point. Then you have the X coordinate of the second point and the Y coordinate of the second point. So that's what those subscripts mean. Okay. One for first point, two for second point. Then what they're doing is they're noticing like, well, if I draw this, if I draw a little line all the way down till I'm parallel with that point right there, I'm here. And then if I draw a line from here until I am parallel with this point, I end up at that same spot, right? But by drawing those two lines, what you've done is you've created this right triangle. And so what you now can do is if you can figure out a representation for those legs, you can go and plug it into the um, Pythagorean theorem, okay? So what they did was is they noticed, well, look, from here to here, it's basically gonna be this Y value this higher y value, right? Minus the lower y value, okay? Or if you do them in the reverse, you could just take the absolute value and it really wouldn't matter what the number is because you'll get the same value, right? It'll either be two or negative two, depending on which one you subtract it from which, okay? But it doesn't matter because if I take the square of it, right? Aren't they gonna be the same? So let's say, pretend, okay? Actually, it'll right on here. Let's pretend that this coordinate was one and three, and this coordinate right here was one and one. It doesn't matter if I do y1 minus y2, which would be three minus one, which is two, or if I do the second y value minus y1, because I will get negative two. And when I go to stick that distance, right, this length here, does it really make sense for it to be a negative two if it's a length? No, right? Which is the whole reason why they're saying to put those bars around it. So that's why these bars are right here because you're trying to represent a length, okay? And so you're not gonna use the negative. You're just gonna say, well, there's a two unit difference here. I have to go one, two, right? In order to get to those two dots. That's all that's important. And if I'm using this as my A, or this as my A in the Pythagorean theorem, it's gonna have to get squared anyway. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing positive two squared or you're doing negative two squared, you're still going to get the same value. So you'll still get the same distance eventually when we get there, okay? 
Same goes for the bottom. At the bottom, it's the same thing, but now you're talking about between this X value and this X value. So you subtract them. The order in which you subtract them makes no difference because you're going to put bars around it. So it's going to be a positive value anyway, okay? Now, how do I put that in the, quad, in the Pythagorean theorem? Well, they labeled this D for distance, okay? So we're gonna calculate that distance. Notice that that's across from the box, isn't it? So that's gonna be like my C, and this is gonna be like my A, and this is gonna be like my B. And again, it doesn't matter if you call the other one B and the other one A, it makes no difference, okay? So notice they did it backwards. They did B squared plus A squared, according to my labels, right? Because my labels, B was for the X's and A was for the Y's, right? They have it here, but they're doing B plus A. Is that the same? Is this the same as this? Are those the exact same thing? Oh. Just looking at it funny. I know why. Because of that guy, right? <laughs> now are they the same? Yeah, they are. <laughs> so even though I labeled them backwards than they did, um, it's still, you're still going to have the same expression. Okay. But if you want to know what D is all by itself, you do have to get rid of that square, which is why they put the square root. Question though, I mentioned in the last class, and I've mentioned it in the, uh, in the lectures as well, that when you take the square root of something, we have to use that, um, what was it, that extracting roots property? And it said that if you had this equal to a number, when you took the square root, you should get plus or minus the square root of that number, right? Why do they not have plus or minus? It has nothing to do with these absolute values, but why did we use the absolute values? Why are those absolute values even there? We said it, but why were they? Remember? Right, right, because that distance can't be positive. I mean, it has to be positive, right? It can't be negative. That's why it's in bars so that we can make sure that that link is a positive value, right? Because link, link is positive. It doesn't make sense to be negative. That means it's like inside something. Okay, um, so that's why they don't have the negative here because you're finding the distance, right? So that's gonna be another link, right? And you can't have a negative link, okay? So even though you would essentially get two answers, you're going to omit the negative link because it does not make sense. So you essentially do have it, but it's not going to be our answer because links cannot be negative. So then what that means is that this is going to be our formula. And notice what I mentioned before, it wouldn't matter whether this number was positive or negative, because once you square it, it's going to be the exact same value. Okay. So notice how they don't write the, parent, the bars anymore. They just put parentheses. Just subtract the two puppies and then square it. You'll get the same thing. It doesn't matter what order you subtract them in, okay? The same thing with the Ys. It does not matter what order you subtract them in, okay? So this one is important. We will need to remember this. I have it memorized, but for you guys, the more you memorize, the better you will be. But I understand you're all learning it, so it's not like you're gonna memorize everything right off the bat, especially when you only see this thing stuff for like a week or two and then all, a week really, and then you have a test, right? But try, try to practice it. Before you go look at it, try to like write it down yourself and then go look at it and see where you get it wrong and then play. Every time you gotta use it, try to remember it. Okay, so for this problem, it says we have these two points, negative two, one and three, four and they want us to find the distance between the two points. Now, I, they, what they do is the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna label your points. Now they did it here. I don't usually write all of that when I'm doing my problems, okay? I don't, 
technically you're supposed to, you're supposed to say, oh, well, let this label apply to this point and let this label apply to that point so that I could pick all the numbers out and put them where they go, right? But for me, I don't do that. I just say, this is the X coordinate of the first point, Y coordinate of the first point, X coordinate of the second point, Y coordinate of the second point. And so I put my labels right next to the values because then it's easier to pull them out later. Whereas if you write it like this, it's still kind of tricky because you have to know that that's the X and that's the Y, right? Then you have to know that this one's the X2 and that one's the Y2. It's still not aligned for me, for my eyes, when you do it that way, okay? I like to label it like this, and then I can clearly see who's the X1, who's the Y2, all of that, okay? Once you have that, you're just a matter of trying to memorize your formula and then plugging everybody in exactly where they go. So if you notice, the first one here is X2, and my X2, that's a three, according to how I labeled it. So that's where this three came from. Now you can use brackets. They just used it because there was an extra parentheses, but I don't use brackets. I usually just use double parentheses. Um, then they have a minus sign. So notice that this minus sign has to be there because it's part of the formula, okay? So you don't get to choose whether it's plus or minus in the middle. It has to be a minus sign there. But then I've got to plug in what X1 is. And X1 happens to be a negative two. And so that's why they have another negative, right? A negative two there. So you have a double. And there's actually a step missing, which I'm gonna write it in in just a little bit. Okay, then again, you don't have a choice. That has to be a plus sign. Y2 is a four, so they plugged in a four. They brought down this minus sign. And then Y1 happens to be a positive one. So it just went in right there. I didn't need an extra parentheses around it, right? So here, if you do have double signs, it's always best to just fix them. So that's three plus two squared. And this is still four minus one squared. And then three plus two is where they got this five from. And then four minus one is where they got this three from. And then if I square the five, I get 25. And if I square the three, I get nine. So when I add those together, I end up with the square root of 34 inside the radical. And then if you use your calculator, oh darn, I didn't bring mine with me. Um, but if you use your calculator, if you type that in there, it's just gonna spit it right back out because it doesn't reduce, okay? But if you hit that little double arrow, it will turn it into the decimal, okay? And so you can still get the decimal. And here it's just checking the answer. I don't ever do this. I mean, you can, but I don't ever do it. Um, it's just saying, well, make sure you check your answers. Like what you had in there and what you had in there should come out to equal what you got for your final answer squared but I don't ever do this. This is assuming that you did everything right. And if you did everything right, there's really no point in checking it. This is the final answer. Okay, so again, important part here is to label them and you have to know what those subscripts mean in order for you to label them correctly. Okay, because I have had people do weird stuff. They've done X1, X2. I've seen people do Y1, Y2. I mean, they just put them in there wrong. But remember, this means the X value of the first coordinate. So there's only one that should have the X1, right? There's only one number in there that deserves that X1 label, okay? So just be very careful when you label. Okay, midpoint formula. And these are gonna be important. Uh, just to give you a little hindsight, okay? Yes, we're learning distance formula. Why do I need to know that for this chapter, right? Or for this unit? It's because in 1.1, we're gonna be talking about circles. And if I give you the center of a circle and another point somewhere on the circle, you should be able to find the distance between those two points to get that radius, right? Or if I give you two points on opposite ends of the circle, regardless of where they are, you should be able to find that distance between them to get the diameter, okay? 
So this will be helpful later. Midpoint is also important. If I do give you the two points on the outsides of the circle, like this, and you do your distance formula, and you figure out that you know this length, well, how the heck do you get the coordinates for that point though? Because you will need to know what the center is. In order for you to write the equation of the circle, and in order for you to graph the circle, you have to have two pieces of information. You have to have the center and you have to have the radius, okay? So the distance formula will always help us to figure out that radius, always. Regardless if I'm finding this little distance, then bam, I have the radius, right? Or if I'm finding this distance, take half of it, and bam, I have the radius, right? But how do we get the center if I'm not given this coordinate? All I'm given is the two out here, and I know this length, right? There's got to be a way to get the coordinates of that guy in the middle. That's where this midpoint formula comes into play. Okay, so it's the purpose of having this guy. So it says for the midpoint formula, if I do have points over here, x1, y1, x2, y2, I can calculate the midpoint formula by doing this formula. Essentially, what you're going to do is you're going to calculate this distance here and then cut it in half, and that'll give you the x coordinate. And then the same thing for the y's. Mine look like they're all together on the same. But imagine it wasn't, right? I'm horrible at drawing circles. How did I paint the card? I don't know, <laughs> but I did. <laughs> um, so if I'm here, right, this, this distance between this x coordinate and that x coordinate, and if I cut it in half, I'm going to have an x coordinate that's right here. If I take this y coordinate and this y coordinate, and then I cut it in half, now I'm in the middle here. Well, where do those two meet? right there and that's the center of the circle okay so we're going to follow this formula but again it matters how you label okay if you label everybody right you just put everybody where they belong and you compute okay not too bad this formula is also good to memorize i know it only because i've used it so many darn times but in the past when i was learning it i just had it on a note sheet and then i would refer to it um, for the test, you will have the distance formula and the midpoint formula. So I, I want you to memorize them for your own benefit, but you will have them available for the test. And it, it helps to prevent, like, for me, anxiety where I start freezing out <laughs> and then I just forget everything. Okay. So having those formulas helps with that a little bit. It gives you a little bit of a comfort zone. Okay. So example three talking about the midpoint of the line segment. So they give us our points here. What should I be labeling negative five? Yes, it's the X coordinate of the very first point reading from left to right, right? What do I call this point or this spot? Y1 and then the nine and the three, Y2, you got it. And so then now it's just a matter of going in here and putting everybody where they go. So for X1, I should be plugging in a negative five. I have to bring down this plus sign. Don't have a choice. That is part of the formula, right? Then the X2 happens to be a positive nine. And this divided by two is also part of the formula. So it's like a standard. You can always just write that down. I'm gonna have Two things added together over two. I know that. It's just a matter of putting the people where they belong, okay? Now, Y1 is a negative three, and Y2 happens to be a positive three. So once you compute this, I think you end up with what, four there? Positive four? And what do I end up with in this numerator? What is negative three plus three? Zero. And then four divided by two? is two and zero divided by two is what? Mm -hmm. And so then this ends up being the, mid, the midpoint. Now I'm going to graph them and I am not using graph paper. So it's not gonna be like perfectly symmetrical or anything like that. I'm just gonna try just to show you a visual of it, okay? So if I'm plotting one, two, three, four, five and one, two, three, about here is where my point is for this, Right. 
Then for this coordinates, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and positive three. So that point is located about there. And they're telling me that halfway in between is going to be two and zero. Does that look about right? It does, right? If you were to draw a line straight from that point to that point, this one lands like right in the center of it, okay? I just wanted you to visually see. Okay, oh, they have it here for me. <laughs> Only I could have seen the back door page. So yes, we got two zero, they graphed it for me. And this is a nice symmetrical graph, so it's probably looks a lot prettier than the way mine did. Okay, but it's there. Okay, now they do want you to stretch this. Everything, that all of the information that we ever give you, they do want you to take it and then be able to apply it just to make sure that you actually understand what's going on. And then that's what gives you the ability to be able to apply it, okay? So you really have to know what's going on in order to be able to do application problems. Um, if you don't know really what's going on with the algebra part, you will struggle with the word problems part. I'll be honest with you, I hate word problems. I hate them. They're the hardest thing ever. Um, some of them, you know, because of my experience are easier than others. But if I see some random problem that I don't that I don't teach regularly in my classes, I'm stumped. I have to sit there for a while <laughs> and like really map out what's going on, what else all the information that I have. I mean, it takes me a while to figure out where it's I mean, I get them, but it's not like, oh yeah, you just do this. <laughs> if it's some problem I've never seen before. Okay. I have to sit there and think about it. Okay. Um, and if you notice, I don't know if you notice, but in your book, there's like I think three, oh, there's like quite a few pages, like maybe 10 pages at the very front that have like how to take notes, have all these formula sheets, you know, all that stuff in the front. One of those sheets is a uh, FOIA's method to problem solving or something like that. And those steps are literally the steps that I have to go through whenever I do solve word problems that I just have no idea how to do, okay? So that does come in handy. Okay, so example four. It says, and if they give me figures, that's always nice because I am visual. <laughs> so it says a football quarterback throws a pass from the 28 yard line, uh, 40 yards from the sideline. And a wide receiver catches the pass on the five yard line, which is 20 yards from the sideline. So it's shown here. So basically, I think these are the sidelines, and then those are all my yard lines, right? And so they basically took that football field and then mapped it on a Cartesian coordinate system, right? They just stuck it right there in the corner of the first quadrant, okay? So it's right here. I have positives and positives. You don't have anything that has to do with the other three quadrants, right, at all here, okay? So they mapped it there and then they said, oh, this guy was at the 28 yard line, so I had to go up 28, but it's 40 yards away from the sideline over here, so I have to go this way 40 yards. And then the person who was catching it, the receiver, they are on the five yard line. So I only go up five, but then they're 20 yards away from the sideline. So that's why their location is here, okay? So this is great. Um, it says the scale along the goal line does not normally appear on a football field. However, when you use a coordinate geometry to solve real life problems, you are free to place the coordinate system in a way that is convenient for the solution of the problem. So that's why they put it in that positive quadrant right there, okay? Oh, what did it want me to find? I didn't even read that. Did I read that? Oh, here's a question. It says, how long is the path? So what are they asking me then? They're asking me, what is this distance that the ball traveled, right? From the guy who threw it and the guy who caught it. They wanna know how far that ball was passed over, okay? So that's basically asking me for the distance. Not midpoint, but the distance, right? So we had the points there. They just put them down instead of having them on the picture. They wrote them down next to each other. And the way that they wrote them down it makes it seem like this one should be X1, this one should be Y1, this one should be X2 and Y2, right? If we use those labels properly. 
And then they're just plugging everybody in. So they plugged in 40 for X1, 20 for X2, 28 for y, uh, Y1, and then 28 for Y2. Notice that they did it backwards, actually. I have no idea why they did that. Does it matter? As long as they're subtracting the X's together and they're subtracting the Y's together, does it matter what order that the Y's or the X's are in? No. So as long as you got both X's in the first parentheses and both X's in the second parentheses, and there's a minus in between each of them. Okay, and I do have that here. 40 and 20 with the minus in between, 28 and five with the minus in between, right? So we're good. So when they do this, they actually get 20 squared. When they do this, they get 23 squared. When you square those, you get these numbers. When you add that together, you get this guy. And when you take the square root, I do not think it is this. Can somebody type that in the calculator and give me the um, actual decimal, like maybe four or five decimal places? Okay, so obviously if they're rounding, it didn't tell me. Normally in the web assign, it does tell you like round to two places or round to the whole number or whatever, but it will tell you how to round your answer. It looks like here that they're rounding to the next the yard, which means this four is not gonna affect that zero, right? So it just stays this 30. If it were 30.5, they probably would have rounded up to 31 yards, right? Well, the sign is nice and that they do tell us how to round the answer. These problems for some reason don't tell me how. Okay, so first practice problem, I want you to try it and then I will do it eventually, but I do want you to try it. There are four, four problems. I think the first one is not too bad. You should be able to do that one pretty quickly. It says, find the coordinate. What does a coordinate look like, first of all? Can you see that word? What does a coordinate look like? Uh -huh, with the parentheses, right? Yes. So it says, find the coordinate. That means it wants this. You see, you know what goes in there, okay? of the point on the x-axis and four units left of the y-axis. So it might be best to draw that and then tell me the coordinates, or if you can go from there and just straight give me the coordinates, that's fine too. I've already expressed to you that I'm visual, so me personally, I would draw that and then give you the answer. Does anybody have any guesses? Nope. It is negative four zero. Okay, let's think about it. Let's draw that. So it says it's going to be on the x axis, but four units left of the y axis. This is the y axis. So four units left would be over here. And then I'm on the x axis, right? And so the x coordinate, I have to go left four. So that means negative four. But did I go up or down from the origin? No, so then it's zero. Okay. So maybe some of you, I don't know if you drew it. Did you draw it? You did draw it? Okay. Let's see, maybe we have to draw them <laughs> to see them so that we know where they are. It's not a bad thing to be that way. Okay. Um, don't think that you're lesser than because somebody can do it without having to graph it and you have to graph it in order to do it. Whatever you got to do, do it. <laughs> okay. So number two is another one that's not too, too um, lengthy in, in uh, you know, writing. But this one says, the, determine the quadrant or quadrants um, in which the point x, y could be located if the x were greater than zero and the y were less than zero. This is the mathematical way of saying that x is positive. And this is the mathematical say, way of saying that y is negative. Okay, so if you're greater than zero, that means you're a positive number, right? If you're negative, then you're gonna be less than zero. So which quadrant is that? Two or four? Where the X is positive, but the Y is negative. 
So it puts me down here somewhere, right? And yes, this one is quadrant one, quadrant two, quadrant three, and quadrant four. So this should be quadrant four. Again, I have to draw it in order to figure out where it is. This one I will let you do. We'll try to calculate the distance between those two points. Yes, that's the square root one, yeah. You might have to go back to the other page. Um, here it is. Uh -huh. So distance formula was this one if you don't have your paper with you. And oh, I forgot. I it turned off because people will be messaging me in the remind. Like, I don't mind if you guys message me whenever it's convenient for you. I just respond to them when it's convenient for me, right? Um, but I get messages at all different times whether I'm in class or asleep, <laughs> just get all the messages. I do not know the answer, so I'm gonna go see if I can find it. Okay, I found the answer. Anybody get an answer yet? Can't be too fast. You got one? Anybody else get an answer? You got one? Not the number one, but an answer. <laughs> you got the answer? A answer? Okay. Anybody want to share what they got? 13? 13? Okay, good. Yes, it is 13. So we'll do this together, x1, y1, x2, y2. So then x2 is a zero minus x1, which is a five. y2, which is 20, y1, an eight. So we get ooh, negative five and a 12. So when we square, we get 25 and 144, which is 169, which is 13. Yay. And that one was exactly 13. It was no decimal. If it was not a pretty square root and you do get a decimal, just pay attention to what, what the sign tells you, how many it wants you to round it, or whether it just wants the exact answer. If you try to do square root of eight in your calculator, not square root of eight, it's a bad one. Um, if you try to do square root of seven in your calculator and it's asking you for your exact answer, if the calculator spits this back out, then that is your exact answer, okay? If you have the square root of eight and the calculator spits out this, this is your exact answer. And if you're lucky like this one, if it spits out a regular whole number, that is also your exact answer, okay? It's when they spit this out and it tells you to round, then you have to hit the double arrows to figure out what those are equivalent to, okay? Okay, one more in the practice. Try that one. And I think you need the midpoint formula. So that one was, um, they use a capital M. I don't know if I wrote it down exactly the way it is over here, but it really doesn't matter if you put the two or the one in front because you're going to add them together anyway. So it really makes no difference. Yeah, I did it the same.
And just, just to something to share, I put these practices in here on purpose. You already have examples, right? I put the practices in there on purpose because it's super important that y'all actually practice this stuff before starting to do your homework. And even the homework itself is more practice, right? Until you eventually get to the test. I think I might've mentioned that in the orientation like way back when, but it might look easy when I'm talking about it, right? And it, it might quote unquote make sense <laughs> when I'm talking about it. It should, that means I'm doing my job as a teacher, right? If I'm trying to help it make sense. Um, but it's the same as if you go to a basketball, an NBA basketball game and you see them and they're playing and they're making it look so easy, right? But it ain't that easy. <laughs> and you need to put in a lot of practice in order to get that good, right? And so that's why I put these practices in here, because if I'm going to expect you to perform well on that test, I need to make sure that you're getting all your practice in. Okay? That's also why we have those correlations with those homework and test scores. Because did you get your practice in or did you not, right? It's super important. OK, anybody get an answer? I know I was talking, but <laughs> you got an answer? Yes? OK, anybody want to share? Share. Five over two and fourteen. Yes, it is. Okay, good. So then let's do the computation. It is five over two and fourteen. So x one, y one, x two, y two. We're gonna do five plus zero over two, eight plus twenty over two. Yep. So you get five over two you get 28 over two. Can this one reduce? If you type it in the calculator, what does it do? It gives you the same thing, right? Yeah, exactly. So that means that is the exact answer. This one though does fit out something different. It gives you that 14. Good. This is perfect. Because five over two is a nice decimal, meaning it doesn't like, you know, keep going and going and going, right? It's just 2.5. You could also enter it like that, and they're both acceptable. The only time you can't do the bottom one is if the directions in WebAssign specifically say type in an integer or a fraction, because that means they either want the whole number to look like that, positive or negative, or they want the fraction, positive or negative. Okay. So just pay special, special attention to it. How are we doing on time? Are we like super early? Oh, yeah, we are. We still have like 42 minutes. Try to see if you can log into your web assignment. And then now we try to knock out that homework assignment. So you don't have no homework tonight if you can get it done in here, right? <laughs> Let me stop the recording because we don't need to hear everybody doing their homework. <laughs> um,